This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this lecture on thermodynamic operations. We are still in the big chapter on distillation and rectification and in this video I would like to introduce batch rectification. Well, why should we regard batch rectification? Well, we have seen in deriving the Rayleigh equation and evaluating that, that for single stage batch distillation the separation is limited only for very specific material systems, namely those with a high relative volatility, the bottom composition and the distillate composition were differing significantly with significant amounts of products. Or if we use general systems or if, if we apply that to general systems, which we of course typically have, we can usually not select the system we want to distill, it's given by the process of interest. For those systems, the separation is limited, that is, the difference between bottom and distillate composition is only uh, limited. We cannot achieve an arbitrary separation. Since we have learned now from the mccabe thiele method, for example, that introducing a certain sequence of theoretical stages to perform the separation, a number of uh, theoretical stages, we may realize that we might apply, may apply that also for batch distillation, which you can then call batch rectification. So this refers to a batch process which applies several theoretical stages and the countercurrent principle. How does that look like? Well, if you look at the corresponding sketch, it looks like that. We have again our reboiler vessel with a certain amount of bottom product and that has of course a given composition XB or not a given, it varies with time as we will see later, we supply a certain reboiler duty. Then we have our multi-stage equipment uh, rectification column and the vapor being removed from the top stage is then condensed to just boiling liquid. So liquid at boiling point and that is then split as we have learned also for the continuous rectification into the reflux and the distillate flow rate. The distillate flow rate has a momentary value of xd characterizing its composition. Of course the compositions all here are identical like with the, uh, as we have seen in the, or discussed also in the Macaptita diagram. This distillate flow rate is then being collected in the distillate vessel where we then receive a certain amount of distillate which has a certain average composition over time. And now we can hope that, of course, the separation between XB and XD can be increased, well, we know it actually, can be increased as compared to single stage uh, separation. It can only get better than single stage, so of course it will be better than that. Okay, first of all, we need to make assumptions in order to be able to describe this process. The first assumption that we want to make is that the hold up in this rectification column here, that that is negligible. That compares to the assumption we made for deriving the Rayleigh equation, because also there we assumed that the amount in the vapor is negligible as compared to the amount in the liquid. That more or less corresponds to each other. Because of that, we can assume that we are operating this equipment in pseudo steady state. So the balances apply as if it were in pseudo, as if it were in steady state. Well, why is that so? Well, you can ask the opposite question. If there were a hold up, what would happen? If there were a hold up, you would have to set up the balances for each compartment in this rectifying column, taking into account that certain amounts are entering from either side, from liquid and, and gas, and certain amounts are, are leaving and you can only get a transient change in composition which depends on the holdup. So the more holdup you have, the slower the process will proceed. And of course you can imagine that if the holdup approaches zero, the changes will be more or less instantaneous. And that means that you have the equations, the balances that you can apply correspond to those of the steady state because every changes, uh, everything changes more or less instantaneously to follow the um, 
steady state balances. So that's one assumption that leads, uh, that allows us to set up the balances in principle for that, quite easily actually. And on the other hand, we want, uh, side we want to assume that the number of theoretical stages is constant in this rectifying column. For most of the distillation systems that will actually apply, we know already that for some systems that may not apply because the efficiency of trays may, for example, depend on composition. In principle, it does so, especially for aqueous systems that is to be regarded, but for most organic systems, you don't need to account for that. As well, the HETS for a packed column changes as a function of composition only for specific systems. It's not a general change. In most cases, you can assume that your HETS is more or less a constant. Of course, you will see later that we can also change the flow rates through the distillation column, which means that also independence of the flow rates is uh, required, which of course is not true, and that's also actually not true for organic systems. So actually the efficiency changes slightly as a function of the load, and so since the load may change, as we will see later, the um, efficiency and the number of theoretical stages may change slightly. But those changes are usually not so dramatic, so it's not such a, bad, such a bad assumption to assume that the number of theoretical stages are constant in this part of the equipment. So let's write down these assumptions at uh, the first step, so to speak. So the assumptions. Because we assume that there's no hold-up, or the hold-up is compa small compared to the liquid that we in, in the reboiler, we can assume that we are in pseudo-steady state. And that the number of theoretical stages is being constant. Okay, so that are the basic assumptions. Now we can also regard how we can operate that process. It's a batch process, which means that, of course, the process will change as a function of time. Everything may change as a function of time, the transient process. Okay, and now we realize that we have one variable, namely the reflux ratio, that is a variable that we can control from the outside. And we can do different things with, with that. On the one hand side, we can adjust the reflux ratio in each moment such that the distillate composition is being constant. Now, if that is constant, we have to adjust the reflux ratio. And we know already actually in which direction we have to uh, shift that, because if we remove preferably a light boiling component with the XD as compared to the XB, the XB will be depleted in light boiling component. That is, the concentration difference between XB and an XD may increase over time, which in turn means, so if we keep that constant for a moment, that means that the uh, stages, the number of theoretical stages, has to cover a larger uh, distance between XB and XD, which means that we require a larger distance between the equilibrium curve and the operating line. Now, the larger the distance, the, uh, the, the, the distance between equilibrium curve and operating line, the fewer theoretical stages you need to achieve a certain separation, or if the um, if your number of theoretical stages is constant, the larger is the spread, so to speak, between XB and XD that you can achieve. And if you want to keep that constant, XB is decreasing over time, that is, the difference is increasing, that means that we have to increase the reflux ratio because that increases the distance between the equilibrium curve and the operating line. Of course, there's a limiting case when we reach the situation where the reflux ratio approaches infinity, which we know is the limiting case, then of course we don't remove any distal product anymore, then we have are in the situation of total reflux, so everything entering here will be going back into the column, no distillate being removed from the equipment, and that is marks, so to speak, the final point. Beyond that, no process operation is possible anymore, at least not such that the XD is being constant. So if we apply that situation or that, that boundary condition that XD is being constant and the reflux ratio is being ch changed, increased as a function of time, then we have some limiting situation. On the other hand side, we can do a different control scheme, which is actually a little bit simpler. We can simply assume that the reflux ratio is being constant. Then, of course, the XD will change as a function of time. 
Yeah, and we can continue with our distillation until the reboiler is empty, but of course it, it means that more and more heavy boiling component is being transferred into the distillate uh, vessel as a function of time, because all the compositions are shifting towards heavy boiling component. So the XD will start out with possibly relatively uh, pure light boiling component, and then as the distillation proceeds, we will eventually, of course, transfer every heavy boiling component. If we still continue beyond certain limits, we will continue to, re to transfer the heavy boiling, or also the heavy boiling components from the bottom vessel into the distillate vessel. So also there, there is some point where we should stop, actually. So we will try to figure out where that point actually is. That are the two operating conditions. On the one hand side, XD can be held constant by varying the reflux ratio, or we have the reflux ratio being constant and then XD is varying. Well, and if you look at the balances, uh, we can already see that actually the balances, if we regard what we have here, no hold up here, and here we have a D dot and XD, we realize that in principle the balances, if we take uh, control volume somehow like that, or just regard more or less a balance around this, we realize that we have more or less the same variables that compare with that, with those that we have used for setting up the Rayleigh equation. Only there we call this the liquid, not the bottom product, but we called it L. D was D already, and then we realize that they are somehow linked via the Rayleigh equation. And for the Rayleigh equation, we had exactly the same situation. We had an XD and, or this was actually a Y and this was an X. Here it's with this current notation, it's XD and XB. And the difference between that was actually in the denominator of the equation. And of course, here we know xb and xd, they can also simply be in the denominator, the difference between those, but they are not linked as in the single stage batch distillation via the equilibrium condition, which we assumed back then. Here, of course, they are linked somehow via something that describes the separation process. And again, we want to assume the Mekaptile diagram or some diagram similar to that. And so we know that the XD and XB simply have to be linked with some step construction and then we can use again the Rayleigh equation because the balances are identical. Yeah, if we just balance, so to speak, what we have here, some XD being removed, it's the same, the, 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 um, the flow rates intersected by the boundary of our control volume is identical to what we had before and inside we have the control volume, we have just the B and XB no hold up here, and we have the xd and d dot leaving. That's exactly the same as we had for deriving the Rayleigh equation. Of course, we can also set up an overall balance with the help of the xd bar, and that's actually the first thing we want to do. Okay, first, now let's uh, write down also, step by step, the two operating modes that we have. So we have two operating modes. We have discussed them a little bit and we know that on the one hand side we can assume that the XD is being constant by adjusting the reflux ratio or we can assume alternatively that the reflux ratio is being constant and in that case of course the XD is a function of time and in that case we can in principle apply the well, Rayleigh type equation. Now for all these cases we can regard the overall balance so to speak. And we can regard that at start, we have a certain amount of uh, liquid in the reboiler vessel, which we can't want to call B0, zero, zero indicating this initial state, and the XBI0, so also the composition, is at some initial state. At some later point in time, we have, of course, a B, which doesn't carry the index zero anymore. That has a composition of XBI. And we have then also collected some distillate, D, with a certain composition, which is XDI bar. So that's what we have collected up there. And of course, the balance has to hold, which means that the, on the one hand side, the B0 equals the B plus D. So what has been put into the reboiler vessel will be found later in the distillate or the reboiler vessel for the overall amount of substance or the overall mass. And we can apply the same, of course, for component I, which means that we have B0 times XBI0 equals BXBI 
plus d times x di bar. And now we do the same things as we usually do. We use the overall balance, solve it for one of the variables, plug it into the equation below, and then we will see what we will be winding up with. Okay, so how do we solve the first equation? Uh, we solve it for b, so b equals b0 minus d, and we can plug that into the bottom equation, and we realize also the individual balance for component i, we uh, see that the b0 x b i0 equals, now the b is being replaced by b0 times x b i minus the d x b i. So this is just replacing this term here, b x b i, with the help of this equality, plus the final term, which is d x d i bar. Okay. Now we can do the typical things we can sort with respect to the amounts of substance, so the B0 and the D0, and if we do that, we obtain that the B0 equals XBI0 minus XBI equals the D times XDI bar minus XBI. And now we can do, as we have done already previously, we can uh, solve for the ratio between the two amounts of substance and we can, for example, with respect, solve for D divided by B0 and that has been now the ratio of the corresponding uh, composition differences and you know what that will be leading to. That will be the level rule in the end. You know that already in principle because we have had that already previously. So we have the XBI0 minus XBI divided by the x d i bar minus x b i. This is, as said, the level rule, and since it relates to certain composition differences, we can look now, or we, we can call that now a divided by b. So the d is proportional to the a, and the b0 is proportional to the b, and this is exactly the level rule because we have the um, x b i 0 minus the x b this xb0 so to speak be corresponding to that and this xd corresponding to that so it's again the opposite uh, so it's the usual level rule as we know it. Well where can we apply that to? Well for that we would like to regard the process in a corresponding diagram so let's first have a first look at the corresponding diagram and it looks like that. Again it's the yx diagram as we know it from the McCaptilo method we know that the xd is being constant for the first case that we want to regard, and this is actually where we want to apply that for in the first step. xd is being constant, so we have a constant intersection of the operating line with the diagonal. That point is fixed as one point of the, of the operating lines. Then we know that the operating lines intersect the y-axis at xd, which is a constant, divided by the reflux ratios, the momentary reflux ratio plus one, and that if the reflux ratio is now increasing over time, we know that that intersection has to move downward because we divide by reflux ratio plus one. And then we have a certain number of theoretical stages which are plotted here between the xd and the xb at some later time. And of course the xb0 is the starting condition. And then we can regard the differences that we had in the equation before. That was just the a, which was the difference between the xb at some later point, minus the xb0, divided by the xb minus the xd, which is exactly this b. At starting point, of course, the a is 0, which means there is no distillate yet, which is, of course, true for the starting condition. And as time proceeds, the a will increase with respect to the b, and that ratio directly relates the dist amount of distillate to the starting amount in, that we supplied in the reboiler, the B0. So if we know these uh, lengths, these differences in composition, we are able to uh, calculate the D from, uh, that we have obtained until a, a certain point. So we will use that in just a moment. And with that we will now work out more or less a strategy in order to um, solve the balances and apply them appropriately. So, as said, we want to have two cases, and let me start a new page for that. The first case 
so it's case 1, the xd is being constant. And in that point, in that situation, of case, the xd bar equals exactly that xd. Well, and how do we start? We have to start that procedure somehow. Now, that depends a little bit on the boundary conditions that are specified. So the first point is we start uh, there, of course, the a equals 0, and we choose a certain starting value for the reflux ratio from which follows the number of theoretical stages required. Of course, what has to be specified, specified is the XBI0. We have to know the composition of the liquid that we want to have, uh, supply in the reboiler vessel. That's for sure. We have to know what we want to separate before we can set up the process. And also, the XDI has to be specified, which is to be constant, of course. So we have to define the task for the separation because that defines, so to speak, the composition that we want to reach in the end in our distillate. And well, how does that work? And I will discuss that you have actually different options depending on what you, which way around the problem is being posed. So if you want to design a new column, you have your XB0, that's what you supply, that's what you have to know. You ask for a certain purity that you want to reach, an XD, and then you well, assume a certain reflux ratio for your start. And then that defines, of course, your operating line. And then you can, the same derivation as before, we know that that always applies, applies also from the general considerations. And then we can simply plot the step construction until we cover the distance between the XD and XB. So until we reach the XB starting from the XD. Again, as before, that must not necessarily be an uh, integer number, it can be also some uh, fraction of a theoretical stage that we need to apply, but that number, also the fractional value, has to be constant afterwards according to assumptions that we made. So that way around, you design, so to speak, your column, and then you actually, as always, have to perform an optimization with respect to your variables that characterize some flow rates. That's true for all separation processes, more or less, that you have to optimize the economy of your process with respect to some variable describing your flow rates. In this case, the variable describing the flow rates is the starting value of the reflux ratio. So that's like for the Mekaptile method, that is the, uh, the parameter which determines the econ economy of the process. So you will have to vary that so as to optimize the overall economic performance. So you start out with a certain value that you regard feasible and that defines your number of theoretical stages and then you build the column. This is one uh, way how to design that. Another option is, of course, it is also quite frequent in industry, in, uh, in real industrial practice, you have a column there. It's designed for batch rectification, it's a multi-purpose equipment, and you would like to know how to operate that and how to design that. For that given equipment, of course, the number of theoretical stages is fixed. So you know your number of theoretical stages. And if now the XD is specified, you know your XB, you know your XD, so you know also this endpoint of your uh, operating line but you don't know the V0. So you have to adjust the V0 such that you have your number of theoretical stages that is realized by this existing equipment between the XD and the XB0. So that way you vary, so to speak, first before you start, you vary this intersection point until you find the point where exactly the number of theoretical stages fits with the chosen reflux ratio and the desired difference between XD and XB0. In any case, at the beginning, there is a consistent set of the following variables, the starting composition in the reboiler, the desired distillate composition, which is constant, the reflux ratio at the start of the process, and the number of theoretical stages that you need in the column. So these four variables are linked via this construction and 
given by the constraints and by the desi uh, design desired purities and the given equipment um, that are given or specified. So with that you get a consistent set of these four variables and that's your starting condition. From that now you start um, your, your design procedure. How does that proceed now? Now the second thing is of course that you know that the number of theoretical stages is constant and with constant n you increase the reflux ratio. So you have a consistent set of these four variables, v0, n, x, b0, and xd, and now you increase the reflux ratio. So increase the reflux ratio. From that follows various x, b, i, I'll just show that, and also a's and b's. How does that look like? Well, let's go back to the construction, uh, to the diagram, and we see if we increase the reflux ratio, that point of intersection will decrease. We can plot the corresponding operating lines because the second point is fixed. And then, in this case, we plot simply the three theoretical stages, either as a dashed curve here, three stages, or the full lines, three steps, which correspond to three theoretical stages, and we see that we reach different purities, different xb, as a function of time, and we can also read the a's and the b's for any of these situations. So that way we get the a and b and the xb as a function of the reflux ratio. Well, since now we know the A's and the B's, we can also evaluate this overall balance. The XD corresponds that we have specified, corresponds to the XD bar, so we can plug in our amounts of substance, our, our um, uh, A's and B's, into the overall balance and determine uh, the corresponding values, because we know, of course, I didn't spell that out, but of course we know how much liquid we put into the v border in the beginning, so we know the B0. So from that follows then the D, and since we know that the overall balance has to hold as well, we, oops, we also know, of course, the B. So we know the D as well as the B, and thus we know, well, we know how much we obtained as a function still of the reflux ratio. Now, of course, working with the reflux ratio as, so to speak, the determining variable is not so nice. What you actually would like to know is the function of time. So you somehow have to relate time and, well, the reflux ratio. Well, how can we do that? Um, how are the amounts of substance and the time related? They are, of course, related, if you think about that, by the reboiler duty. You supply a certain reboiler duty that generates a certain vapor flow rate. And from this vapor flow rate that is then condensed at the, at the, the condenser and partially fed back into the column, a certain amount constitutes the D dot, the momentary flow rate of the distillate from the column into the distillate vessel. So the reboiler duty in the end determines the D dot, that means it determines a change in the amount of distillate as a function of time, and that way the time and the amounts of substance are related. So for this last step of linking time to these variables that we have de determined before, we somehow have to apply the balance for taking into account the reboiler duty. And actually we know that equation already. You can look it up. We know we are in pseudo steady state, so we can apply the steady state balances. And we have derived this equation actually exactly for the mccabe thiele method for the continuous rectification. There we obtained an equation for the q dot b. Of course, in our situation, we don't have a feed. So we can set the feed with the corresponding q value to zero, no feed. And then we can simply apply the balance or the result of the balance that we obtained at that point, just as we had it there. How does it read? Well, it was simply that the reflux ratio, which in our case is of course a function of the amount of distillate plus one, times the d dot times the delta hv. Remember somehow possibly that that looked similar to that. 
possibly remember. So we skipped that extra term that we had accounting for the feed because there is no feed in our sit current situation. So we have the V plus 1 times the D dot times delta HV, the enthalpy of vaporization. And now, of course, we have to um, solve that for the D dot on the one hand side. So we can do that. So D dot equals uh, now the Q dot B divided by the reflux ratio, which is a function of the distillate, plus 1 times delta HV. And of course, we know that the D dot actually is the DD with respect to DT, and that links these two. So we can actually uh, solve that for the DT. We want to know the time step, so to speak. So we can say that DT equals now the reflux ratio, which is a function of the amount of distillate, plus 1, times the delta HV divided by the Q dot B times DD. Okay, let me scroll up a bit, little bit, just a little bit. We have various values of reflux ratio chosen. And for these various values of the reflux ratio, we obtained on the one hand side the compositions, but also the D. So we know steps in reflux ratio lead to steps in amount of distillate obtained. And now we substitute, so to speak, here the differentials by the corresponding differences. We use the reflux ratio at the moment that we have chosen at one of these steps, plus one times something which char characterizes our system that we want to separate. That's the um, enthalpy of vaporization. So for the given system, we have to know that. Divide that by the reboiler duty and multiply it with the difference between two of these uh, reflux ratio steps with respect to D. So we substitute the delta D here, and of course we obtain then the corresponding delta T between the two choices of the reflux ratio. Possibly you will, so to speak, if you have the difference between two points, two values of the reflux ratio, you will supply the average value for the reflux ratio plus one, evaluate that with the distillate amount step and determine the time step from that. And which means that now, of course, we know the time steps. And that means from that follows now the D as a function of time, the reflux ratio, of course, as well as a function of time. And since all these variables are linked to D and reflux ratio, it follows also, of course, the XB uh, I of T, for example, and of course, our B as a function of T. So we know everything. We have designed the process. And now, of course, our starting choice, the starting value for the V0 was still arbitrary. So we get from this overall process a certain economy, a certain energy that we have to input into the system. And we get a certain product amount in a certain amount of time. All that relates to cost, so to speak. And that means that if we choose a slightly different value, we can optimize by choosing different values here, we can optimize the economy of the overall process. That's actually how we can do that. So with that, we are able to design the process and we can base that uh, on this diagram that we have seen now already several times. Hey, come on. Here we go. Um, based on this diagram, changing the reflux ratio, we can determine everything. So again, the makeup tele diagram is a solution, so to speak, for our design task or supplies a solution for the, our design task. Now, the reflux ratio is, of course, changing as a function of time. And um, the question is, well, how does that change as a function of time? Or in the case that I want to regard, it's as a function of the amount of distillate. Actually, it's plotted inversely here. It's the amount of distillate versus the reflux ratio, which is shown here. Of course, we start out with a certain value or starting value for the reflux ratio. We continue to distill on. The amount of distillate will increase from zero. It will increase. And we have to increase the reflux ratio. So we have a positive slope of this dependence, so to speak. And we realize that we cannot go beyond a certain point because at that point, the uh, reflux ratio for a given limit, so to speak, of the amount of distillate approaches infinity. 
Reflux ratio approaching infinity is, of course, that limiting case that I mentioned already that relates to the total reflux. And that is fully understandable, of course, if I switch back one slide. Of course, if the reflux ratio, uh, ratio approach, approaches infinity, total reflux, it will coincide with the diagonal. And then we will have a certain number of theoretical stages, in this case three stages, between the xd and some bottom value xb. And that is the lowest value of b that we can achieve. So if the reflux ratio approaches infinity, there is a limit to the operation because the number of theoretical stages between equilibrium curve and our diagonal, in that case, leads to a lowest value of the xb that we can achieve. And of course, that relates also to an a and a b. And the a determines, again, then the amount of distillate. And that's the maximum amount of distillate that we can achieve, still keeping the xd constant. So if we would still remove some distillate from the equipment, our xd would definitely have to change. As I said, balances are fundamentally correct, so we can't do anything against them. We have to live with them, so the xd would have to change if we still would continue to distill. Okay. So I think we have discussed now sufficiently enough the case where the xd is being constant. The, uh, the other alternative is, of course, that we keep the reflux ratio constant. And also here we would like to first have a look at the corresponding Macaptide diagram. Here the reflux ratio is constant. Remember operating line equation for the rectifying line? How was that? There was a slope defined, and the slope was reflux ratio divided by reflux ratio plus 1. If we keep the reflux ratio constant, that means that the slope of the operating line is kept constant. So our different operating lines corresponding to different moments in time have to be parallel because they all have the same slope. That means they indeed intersect the diagonal at different compositions relating, of course, to the different values of xd. And again, we have our number of theoretical stages that we now have to supply to uh, cover the distance between the xd and an xb. In this case, the number of theoretical stages is 4, so we plot for the dotted starting condition, so to speak, our four theoretical stages between the equilibrium curve and the operating line to reach our starting value of xb. Then at some later times, the lower values, let's look at the latest point in time that is regarded here, the, this xd, so the lowest value, we get this operating line for theoretical stages again, and we reach this xb. So here, apparently, the xb and the xd are linked via this parallel shift in the operating line and the construction of the given number of theoretical stages between that operating line that results from that choice of xd and the equilibrium curve. And we realize, of course, that in principle that operating can, line can move downward as far as you like. You will always get a difference between xb and xd with a given number of theoretical stages. Of course, that will shrink as you approach this lower limit here, but in principle, of course, you can continue the process arbitrarily. So there's no theoretical limit to that. Only if the reboiler is, of course, empty, if there's no liquid left anymore, then you have to stop the process. But that's a not a so very efficient point, of course. Just looking at the balances, now everything that you had in the reboiler before will be in the distillate vessel. And so also the composition that you had in the reboiler will be in the distillate vessel. So that's not really a separation process. Perhaps if you have some solids in your system, you may use that to get rid of the solids, but otherwise it is not really doesn't make any sense. Okay, so we know in principle how it looks like, and now we want to set up the procedure, how we want to set up these things. In the beginning, we do exactly the same as before. We have to find a consistent set of the starting variables, which are the xd0 in this case, the xb0, the xd0 here, well, it's defined already, and the reflux ratio, and the number of theoretical stages. So it's again these four variables that are linked, the xd0, the xb0, reflux ratio and number of theoretical stages. Here now, of course, the reflux ratio is constant, doesn't carry the index. Here the xd, which is now the function of time, carries the index that is changed in this stepwise uh, design method. 
So we get a desert again, this consistent value, and now again depends on how you pose your problem. If you really are in a design process, you choose your XD0, for example, the, and your V, and then you do your construction and get, of course, you know your XB0. That again has to be specified. You always have to know what you want to separate. And the XD0, the reflux ratio, you get your number of theoretical stages required for this operating line. Of course, depending on the equilibrium, that is some number. And depending on the choice of XB0, XD0 and the reflux ratio. Again, you will, of course, vary the reflux ratio. Usually your purity is somehow specified. Of course, the average composition is specified. So you have to average later over the, all these XDs in order to get your product specific or the, that composition that you have to compare to your product specification. But any, again, you, have to, to, you can vary the reflux ratio, so the slope of the operating line, and that relates later to economy. So you will vary this construction, you will perform it several times for different values of the reflux ratio in order to optimize your process. Anyway, at the starting point, you get a consistent set of XB0, XD0, reflux ratio and the number of theoretical stages. And as before, you can also use that, of course, for a given distillation column there, the number of theoretical stages is specified. And you could adjust now either the XD0 or the reflux ratio so that it fits, so to speak. Anyway, you get these four variables. And then you proceed now by not shifting the reflux ratio as before, but now shifting the XD. And that's exactly what you do. So we set up, we want to set up the corresponding procedure for this second case, where now the reflux ratio is being constant. So this is case two. Again, starting point is that we start out with this state zero. We choose a reflux ratio. We know this can be optimized later in order to get economically feasible processes. The XBI zero is specified. You can also choose or specify, actually you will actually specify usually the average value, presumably the XDI0, and from that follows the N. Now you get a consistent set of reflux ratio XBI0, XDI0, and N, whichever way around you pose your problem, as discussed before. Okay, then in the next step, you vary your XD as just mentioned. So you vary XDI, and that is, of course, the momentary value. Yeah, that's not to be confused with the XD bar. This is really the momentary value that is being removed from the distillate value or for uh, the, the, the reboiler uh, vessel, actually from the distillation column. So that's a momentary value. Reflux ratio is constant. We know that. I can repeat it here. And from that follows then, of course, the XBI. Let's have a look again at the diagram. If we vary the XD, the slope of the rectifying line is constant is given, so the rectifying line is specified, and then we can construct our number of theoretical stages between the corresponding operating line and the equilibrium curve, and then with that number achieve the corresponding XBI at, for that chosen uh, XD. Okay, so what do we do then? Then we know actually the momentary values of XD and XB. Remember what I told you in the beginning of this video? I told you we need to know XB and XD and how, especially the difference, because we can plug that into the Rayleigh equation because the balance for the Rayleigh equation is actually the same as we had for the single stage distillation. So as a, as a third stage a step now, we can use the following equation and I re rewrite I rewrite that with the current notation. It's a log of B over B zero. Remember, that was the L over L0, but that referred to the reboiler uh, content. Equals the integral from an XBI0 to an XBI 
integral of the dx bi prime. Prime was to distinguish the upper limit from the momentary value, so from the running variable underneath the integral, divided by x di minus x b i prime. And this we know now because we know the momentary difference between the x d and the x b. So we can plug that in and integrate that for, of course, different steps. So we have to have to do that with also increments in the dx b, so to speak, and have to add that up. And we then will be able to determine the b over b0. Since we know the b0, we know how much we put into the reboiler at start, we are able to determine the b at a later point in time. So from that follows actually the b as a function of the x d i. If we know the b, of course we can also determine from the overall balance that always applies, that was very generally uh, derived, so, so from the overall balance that we derived before regarding the two operation modes. So from that follows on the one hand side the d, b plus d has to be b0, since we know b0, we know also b, we are able to determine the d, and then we can solve um, the corresponding equation to determine that x d i bar. That corresponds to this b and to this x d that we have varied. And then in the end we again have to use something to relate time and the process of uh, the pro progress of the process. So in step 5 what we do, we again apply this equation that we know already. dt is now a reflux ratio which is now a constant, plus 1 times the delta Hv, divided by the reboiler duty times the dd. And there you realize that of course if this is a constant, the reflux ratio, the material system, according to McCabe-Thiele assumptions, that delta Hv is also constant. If you supply con a constant reboiler duty as a function of time, then dt and dd are just related by a constant value. And that way you are, of course, able then to relate everything to time. As before, you plug in the different, for the different chosen xd, you plug in the corresponding values of d, the Delta, delta D, so to speak, that you achieve, and they relate directly to a delta T, and since you start at the start, at zero times zero, you are then able to relate everything by uh, summing up these time steps uh, so that you know at which time you have actually reached this X, D, this B, and that D. So from that follows all the variables as a function of time, which means you have then the D as a function of time, the X, D, i as a function of time, the x d i bar as a function of time, the b as a function of time. If you like, you also have, of course, the x b i as a function of time. And with that, you are apparently able, again, to design your process. And now you can, of course, change your choices, your starting condition choices, so to speak. You can change, for example, the reflux ratio and do the same uh, procedure again for a slightly varied reflux ratio and thus optimize the overall performance with respect to the economy of the process. Okay, so now we know how to understand um, this diagram, how this is actually evaluated. We know that we vary that, we get the different values here, plug them into the equations, the balances and are able to describe the progress of the process. Actually, I would like to show you how that really works, but in order to do that, we have to make an additional assumption, because uh, actually I was too lazy. I didn't want to evaluate all these step constructions. In principle, it's possible, of course, but it's a little bit tedious. And so what I, I wanted to do was actually to get a very simple equation. And you can achieve a simple equation if you assume that your reflux ratio is high, approaches infinity. So we assume that we are at total reflux for the moment. And of course, the principal performance of the process for a system or a process with a high reflux ratio will not differ so much from the case of total reflux. And the principal behavior will also hold, of course, for the situation of a finite reflux. 
And if you evaluate that, that is plug the corresponding difference between Xb and Xd, which with total reflux can easily be calculated from a constant um, relative volatility, you can plug that into the Rayleigh equation, evaluate that, and if you do that, you get this result. We know this diagram already partially because this includes the case that we have looked at already with the theoretical stages at uh, equal one, which means single stage batch distillation solved by the Rayleigh equation. And there we had this diagram with the blue curves, the Xb as a function of the progress in distillation. And that means, of course, that in that case, uh, for the stage number one, we, uh, number of stages equal one, we regarded different relative volatilities, 1.5, 2, I skipped actually one, which was 5, and 10, and we saw that for some arbitrary relative volatilities, the decrease in composition is pretty slow, which means also the purity of the distillation product will be relatively low, and only for specific systems with a very high relative volatility, it was in principle able to get some separation going on with finite values and not non-zero values. So here, of course, you reach your composition here, but that's only the last drop that will be more or less pure heavy boiling component in the, in the reboiler. That's what we found out, if you remember. And now we try to use the worst case, that is alpha equals 1.5, and increase the number of theoretical stages in the process. And then we see that for increasing the number of theoretical stages from 1 to 2, we already get a significant improvement. If we add an increase the number to 5, we get this, 10 and 20. And we see that actually in the case of 20 theoretical stages, it's almost perfect for that situation because the composition is directly decreasing. And here you realize that you need only to distill off 25% of what you have put into the um, uh, reboiler vessel at start to reach a reboiler composition of zero. So you have depleted the reboiler vessel more or less of all light boiling component if you distill off 25% of that liquid. Remember that at start only 25% of light boiling component were in that reboiler vessel, so you distilled essentially of pure light boiling component in that case for the 20 theoretical stages, so the overall distillate composition, the XD bar for that case, should be more or less pure light boiling component yeah, for that case. So with 20 theoretical stages, even for that not so easy to separate system, but it's a typical system, you can distill also at lower relative volatilities without significant problem, but so that's more or less a typical situation. With a sufficient number of theoretical stages, you will get essentially high, uh, arbitrary purity with that. Now, of course, the question is how does that composition of the distillate change as a function of time, and this is shown here. And again, we see that for the single stage uh, separation in, shown in blue, the distillate will never be any pure, uh, even for a relative volatility of 10, we don't reach an arbitrary purity. Only for very, very specific systems with an extremely high relative volatility, we are able to get more or less pure light boiling component as, this, as distillate. And that is, of course, not a very significant or typical case. So it's only very exceptional, so to speak. On the other hand, we realize if we um, increase the number of theoretical stages, again shown in red, we realize that as we increase the number of theoretical stages, even for this very bad system of relative volatility of 1.5, we get a significant shift in composition and already with 10 theoretical stages, we are almost there with almost pure beyond, uh, above 90% distillate composition. And if we have the 20 theoretical stages, we indeed see that we start out with more or less pure uh, light boiling component at the start. So the composition of the XD bar is 1, describing as always a light boiling component. So the X of the light boiling component is 1. And only after that has been distilled off from the reboiler, the composition will decrease. And of course, it will approach 25% uh, at the end, because as mentioned before, if you have distilled off everything, so nothing remains in the reboiler, then everything will be in, in the distillate vessel. And since you start out from uh, the 25% that we have seen before, you will wind up in the end also with 25% of light boiling component in the distillate vessel if you have distilled off everything.
Okay, so we see that indeed it is possible to achieve significant separation and we have seen how to design that based on the Merkaptila concept as well as the corresponding balances. With that I would like to summarize the things that we have seen. Multi-stage batch distillation is significantly more efficient as compared to single-stage distillation that we have looked at with the Rayleigh equation in the very beginning of this lecture. The process can also be depicted in the Merkaptila diagram and with the help of the appropriate balances can thus be designed. So we again see step construction relating to the theoretical stages allows us to design the process of course linked with the corresponding balances. With that I would like to say thank you for this video and I hope to see you in the next video.